This first lecture will deal with several different aspects that are related to this course. And the first thing that we'll discuss is the dimensions of historical geography. First of all, it's spatial. It actually happened in a particular place. We have the geography that helps us to understand both the Old Testament and the New Testament. G. Ernest Wright said that Christianity and Judaism both demand geography. It's also temporal. It's the historical account of God's dealing with a people. The series of events leading to Messiah. It will require maps for different periods because they keep changing and will have different circumstances. The definition of history is basically man's reflection on his past. We must distinguish between history and archaeology. No real history is possible without writing. Paleography, epigraphy, grammar, syntax, and discourse analysis are all tools. This course also deals with culture. Revelation has been couched in human terms. The Old Testament must be interpreted in terms of the ancient Near Eastern culture. Archaeology tells us about houses, other buildings, fortifications, tools, uh, anything that can be found in an excavation. It is also spiritual. In the case of both Judaism and Christianity, it took place in the Holy Land, and the holy sites are very important to us. They must be kept open. Religion in antiquity was not a separate compartment of life. It was integral to everything that happened that is, to everyday life. There are several disciplines in historical geography. One is the physical geography. All scientific methodologies must be used in the study of historical geography. There's geology and orography. Geomorphology is a science that deals with the land and submarine relief features of the Earth's surface and seeks a genetic interpretation of them through using the principles of physiography in its descriptive aspects and of dynamic and structural geology in its explanatory phases. We deal with ecology soils, rocks, their potential, the flora and fauna, and their contribution. Hydrology, water sources, and the means of their use. Meteorology, changing weather patterns as affecting the way of life in the various periods. Cartography, this is recording of the data and representing it on paper. Typography is the description of a place. It's physical geography, the detailed and accurate description of a place or region. The art of representing on a map the exact physical configuration of a place or regions. It's the features of a place or region. Just a note here, uh, Nelson Glick wrote about the Negev, but he means the area south of the biblical Negev. Dennis Bailey is very poor on the Negev. 
In our preliminary view, we're going to look at the land of Israel in four important north-south zones of relief. The coastal plain, the central mountains, or the western highlands, the rift valley, or the central valley, and the Transjordan Plateau, or the eastern plateau. Now we will take a look at that in great details a little later. We also have regions of difficulty. There are basalt regions of the Transjordan and the Syrian deserts. There are mountains. There are forests and marshes. The Hula Basin, the plains of Sharon, and Ezralon Plain, area north of Mount Carmel. The detail of topography will come later. We also have philology. Philology is the study of texts. In the Bible, there are 475 local geographical names. These are used as historical geographical sources and they depend on two decisive questions. The list's primary function and when was the list written? Just as an illustration, in Genesis 23-2, with the death of Sarah, the text tells us that she died at Kiriath Arba, that is, Hebron. This tells us that formerly Kiriath Arba was the name of the town, and then it was later changed to Hebron. Another illustration has to do with the movement of the tribe of Dan from the south to the north. When they came to the city of Laish, they captured the city, killed its people, and then settled in the same place, but they now called it Dan. There are historical geographical descriptions. We have a number of these. In Genesis 10, we have a table of nations. This is talking to us about the three sons of Noah. We have rosters of conquered Canaanite cities in Joshua 12. The land which remains, that is the land that has not been conquered by Joshua, will be given to us in Joshua 13, verses 1 through 6, and in Judges 3, 1 through 4. We also have the itinerary of the wandering Israelites. Moses gave us this in Numbers 33. We have administrative territorial lists. For instance, Solomon had divided his kingdom into 12 districts, and these are used to supply him the food that he needs every month. And then we have expeditions and conquests, uh, where the soldiers go out to fight a particular battle. Then we have epigraphical documents of the Old Testament period. We have a number of these from the Egyptian source. The expeditions journals, they kept very close tabs on the battles that they fought, the countries that they conquested. These are preserved for us on the walls of temples. There are also bar reliefs. These tell us what the people looked like, uh, the various uh, cities that were uh, conquered. We have topographical lists. They like to record the people uh, that became their slaves and often pictured these on their monuments. We have literary papyri. For instance, the travels of Winamon or Sinuhe. These are literary in form. 
and then administrative papyri. Uh, these talked about the various administrations. It may be that uh, the pharaoh has sent somebody out to get uh, rock or some kind of turquoise, and that will be recorded. And then we have execration texts. These are the ones that record what uh, the pharaoh has done in the latest battle. And then we have several uh, correspondence archives. For instance, the archives of Elamarna. Then we have many Mesopotamian sources as well. And uh, these are found on the walls of the palaces in Mesopotamia. And then many Palestinian sources are helpful for this task. We have the Misha stone. This was a monument sent up by Misha after he rebelled from the country of Israel. The Samaria ostraca. Uh, these are ostraca that were found in Samaria and they give us historical information about certain events. Many royal seal impressions have been found that uh, came from jar handles. Uh, these were for the transportation, usually of food for oil or for grain or items like that. And then we have the Lakish letters, very important to us because they describe what went on while the country was being invaded by another large country such as Assyria. These letters were written from the city of Lachish to the city of Jerusalem. Then after the Old Testament period, we have several texts. The Talmudic debates on location of biblical sites, and many of these were discussed. We have Eusebius, who lived in the end of the third century, the beginning of the fourth. He lived at Caesarea. He compiled a list of place names from the Bible. He used Roman maps and gave mileage between important points. His work is called the Onomasticon. Avi Yona uses these to give district boundaries. He combines this information with biblical text and tells how far a town is from an administrative center. There is Jerome. He's the one that translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. He did that about 400 AD. He lived at Bethlehem and he translated Eusebius into Latin. We have the Madaba mosaic map. This is dated to the 6th century. It's on the floor of a church in Transjordan and it is based on Eusebius. And this map happens to be east-oriented. There are also itineraries of pilgrims from the Middle Ages. There are a number of these. John Wilkinson published Jerusalem Pilgrims Before the Crusades. This was done in 1977. And it mentions Nathan Shure, Jerusalem in Pilgrims and Travelers Accounts a thematic bibliography of Western Christian itineraries from 1300 to 1917. So this was a number of years, over 400 years, that there were people visiting the Holy Land and writing about it. Ethori Ha Parhi was a Jew from Florence, he lived in Beit Shan in the first half of the 14th century. He spent seven years studying locations and biblical and Talmudic sites. 
he wrote apologetic to defend all of Eretz Israel, and many of his identifications still stand. He wrote Kaftor Vafera. He differed with Judah Hakasi on the limits of the Holy Land. Adrian Reland, in the last of the 17th century, Palestini et Monumentus Veribus Illustrata. He published this in Ultrec in 1714. These are massive collection of information from all available sources. However, Adrian Reland, though he gave us so much, never visited Israel itself. Modern philological research uses all texts and sources, historians, Egyptian, Akkadian texts, and so forth. Now we have toponymy. This is a corpus of place names found in Palestine. Every independent settlement in the Bible is called a town, without distinction as to its nature and size. It may be a very small area without a wall, close to another town, but still it itself would be called a town. The continuity of ancient sites is caused by the choice of the site in the first place. There are four main reasons why a site is chosen for occupation. The first is strategic. It may be on crossroads, important crossroads, and therefore a town would be built there uh, in order to protect the site. It may have a good water supply. It has springs or cisterns. If that is so, a town will be built beside the spring. It may be a thoroughfare, like the Via Maris, at the entrance to every pass from Jezreel Plain to Sharon, we have cities, Jachnium, Tel Abu Tzarik, Tel Abu Shushbe, Megiddo, and Ta'anach. Or, the last, it has good agricultural land. So if it has one of those four, it will be settled again and again and again. Now the origin of the place names and their meanings are taken from several places. They could be preserved in Palestine throughout thousands of years. And the reasons for this is that the residents spoke Semitic languages. Usually a continuity of settlement so that each new wave of residents inherited the older names from their predecessors. Many geographical names may be explained with certainty. Divine names words containing the word Beth are related to the temple of some god, like Baal. If you have the name such as that, the name of a god, uh, then that explains it. it is a divine name. The names of men or clans all come into being in the Israelite period. The definition of a region or an area, the definition itself may describe the area. The nature of the site and its surroundings are quite widespread. Illustrations, Giba, that means hill, or Rama, that means height. It may be an agricultural feature. The nature of the soil, Tov, which means good, or local produce, Beth Hakerem, that means a vineyard, central agricultural installations like Goran, 
refers to a threshing floor. Names related to water sources, such as Ein, such as Ein Gedi, or Ein Giva, or beer, beer Shiva, this refers to a well or a water source. Then it may be special buildings, uh, particular buildings characterizing the settlement. Mahanayim, that's what Jacob called the uh, town in Transjordan, which means the two camps. Or Migdal, which is a fortification. Or a cultic installation, Ramot, or height for an altar. General characteristics, circumference, Raba, meaning great, or main. The possession, Helkot, the plot of land, or Kadesh, which means a sanctuary. The names of animals could be used, like Hazar Susim, which means horses, or the names of plants, Beth Tapua, means apple. Instances of changing the former name by the Israelites are quite rare. The only certain example is the one I mentioned before where Laish is changed to the name Dan. There are surveys in the 19th century, and none of these researches was based on archaeological work since that did not begin in Palestine until 1890 with the work of Sir Flinders Petrie at Tel El Hesse. There was Seetzen, U.J. Seetzen, Reiser, Dürk, Syrian, Palestina, Phoenicia, etc. Published in Berlin in around 1855, it described many places, especially the site of Masada. J.C. Burkhart travels in Syria and the Holy Land, published in 1822. Edward Robinson, Biblical Researches in Palestine and the Adjacent Regions, published in London in 1856. He established the scientific base for future studies. He was assisted by his student, Eli Smith. Eli Smith had worked as a missionary in Lebanon for years and knew Arabic fluently. He compared topography, the sources, and Arabic names that were then current. Guerin, Description De La Palestine in 1880. And then a very important work was by C. R. Condor and H. H. Kishner, The Survey of Western Palestine. They did this between 1881 and 1883. It established the Palestinian Exploration Fund. And they also published a map that is called the Palestine Exploration Fund map in 1878. G. Schumacher, Unsere Arbeiten in Estjordanland from 1913 to 1970 and across the Jordan in 1886. He made the same kind of survey in Transjordan as Condor had done in Palestine. E. H. Palmer compiled a study of the place names in Arabic and English based on the map sections of the PEF map entitled SWP Arabic and English Name Lists, published in London in 1881. And then finally, G. A. Smith summed up 
the researches of the above man in his famous The Historical Geography of the Holy Land. That has gone into I don't know how many different editions. Now we come to archaeology. Remember, it did not occur until 1889 with Sir Flinders Petrie. Well, archaeology is the scholarly investigation of past human life, especially as it is revealed through the relics, that is, the material objects that have survived from ancient times. Archaeology is a specialty of its own. Sometimes it's called biblical archaeology. This includes the areas of Mesopotamia, Iran, Egypt, and others. Any land which has some kind of relationship to the Old Testament is included in biblical archaeology. Then there is what is called archaeology of Palestine, and that is limited to Israel itself, Eretz Yisrael. The interpretation of archaeological information is subjective. Every archaeologist has their own identification of what is found in their mound. And most of these are mounds because they are cities that were on a hill, but then same city was repeated over and over again. And the archaeologist who does the excavation feels that he has the interpretation needed for his particular mound. And they do not always agree. And oftentimes you will find somebody that comes in later and makes an excavation and proves them wrong in the first place. Now we have the biblical view of the world and the table of nations. The table of nations reflects the ethnic and geographic world known to Israel during her apogee, and it gives a faithful sketch of Palestine's position among the peoples and kingdoms of the ancient Near East where the three spheres of Shem, Ham, and Japheth intersected. Shem is in the east. He's the father of the children of Eber. Ham is in the south. It included Canaan. And Japheth is in the north and west. Now, for the biblical view of world anthropology, we have Genesis 10 and 1 Chronicles 1, 4 through 23. There are three main branches, and they are after the sons of Noah. There is Japheth, and that includes Gomer, who is the Sumerians, a people from Calchris and Magog, Medaic, which is Indo-European nation situated in uh, northwestern Iran, Javan, which is uh, equivalent to Ionia or Greece, Tubal and Meshach, and Tyron, three nations in Anatolia. The first two are Tabal and Mushki, the Phrygian kingdoms of Cappadocia known from Assyrian inscriptions. Tyrus might be uh, Trisinoi of the Greek sources, that is the Etruscans. The sons of Homer are Ashkenaz, who are the Scythians, Rephath, who is unknown, and Targumah, the Tilgamiru of the Assyrian texts. The sons of Javan are Elisha, Elisha is on the south coast of Cyprus, Tarshish in Cilicia, Kittim, the kingdom of Kittion, and the Dodanim, corrected to Rodanin. The Hebrew has the Dalit 
and the Raish, which are very similar, and sometimes those two are mixed. And so this has been corrected. Instead of do danim, it's ro danim, perhaps robes. Ham is the second son, and he's Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. This group includes three elements in Africa. Cush is Nubia, Mitzrayim is Egypt, Put is on the Libyan coast. The link between Cush and Nimrud, the mighty hunter, is strange. The third son is Shem, and the descendants are even more obscure and speculative than the other two sons. The descendants of Eber is emphasized. These are the Hebrews or the Israelites. They are Semitic speaking. Their similarity with the ethnic picture of Ezekiel 27 indicates that it reflects a viewpoint of a very late period. The Hurrians and the Urartians are missing. Each nation was assigned to the care of a specific heavenly being, according to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. The Semites are in three groups, Ashur in Mesopotamia, Aram extended to northern Mesopotamia, to Assyria and northern Transjordan, and the tribes of South Arabia. It mentions that God divided all mankind into these three divisions and put a heavenly being over each state.